The year is 1961. The world is on the verge of beginning the exploration of outer space. At the forefront of the American mind, and the Soviet mind, is the Cold War. The entire reason behind the rise of the space race to begin with, this technological arms race between two world superpowers reached its peak in the early 1960s. Geopolitical tensions between the two former allies of World War II were at an all-time high, and the world was a very paranoid place. Propaganda on both sides was everywhere. The Soviets condemned the United States as an aggressive imperialist power with desires for world domination, and the United States condemned the Soviet Union as a symbol of communism, an oppressive and evil ideology that was a direct threat to American freedoms. Espionage was a common practice, both sides deploying secret agents with false identities to gather information about their enemies. Both sides fought for dominance of nuclear weapons power, a technology only developed at the end of the Second World War, and now seeking to be more refined and its deployment made more precise. Both countries were terrified that the other would drop the bombs first, adopting civil defense programs such as the United States' iconic duck and cover drills. For many, the world seemed to be on the brink of yet another world war. And at times it was, because the Cold War got a lot hotter than most people realize, though thankfully, it never happened. At the forefront of the Cold War was also the space race, which in 1961 was just getting underway. The Soviet Union had demonstrated an early lead with their robust and effective R-7 rocket, launching their first satellite in 1957, and the United States were struggling to play catch-up. Just this year, the Soviets had also put a human being into Earth orbit, Yuri Gagarin aboard Vostok 1, and the US needed a way to one-up them. Though this wasn't directly the way they ended up doing it, one idea ended up with a US space program turning the entire planet into a Saturn analog. During the summer of 1963, Earth had an artificial ring around it made of copper. While spaceflight and orbital satellites had proven to be a viable technology, what was not yet prevalent at this time was satellites used for communication. Early efforts had occurred, Project SCORE launched by the US Army in 1958 used a tape recorder to receive, store, and retransmit messages from antennas on the ground. This is the President of the United States speaking. Through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in outer space. My message is a simple one. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind America's wish for peace on earth and goodwill toward men everywhere. However, it would be some time before telecommunications companies would begin to design and contract the launches of more effective and active communication satellites. For the time being, the primary method of communicating over vast distances was not in space, it was underwater. Beginning almost a century earlier in the 1850s, submarine communications cables began to be laid across the ocean floors, carrying telegraphy traffic across continents and establishing the first instantaneous communications links. By 1872, special cable-laying ships had connected all of the world's continents save for Antarctica, and later generations of cable would incorporate telephone networks, then data communications. For the next century, these cables would provide the primary means of communicating across the oceans. But the Cold War began to make people worry. The concern was simple if overly paranoid, but such was the style at the time. What if the Soviets cut the cables? In the unlikely, though less unlikely than you'd think, event that the Cold War suddenly turned hot, a very intelligent and devastating strategy directly preceding an attack on American soil would be disabling communications. At this time, taking down undersea cables would leave the United States with only one option for long-range communications, ionosphere bounces. Referred to officially as Skywave, radio operators have known how to bounce shortwave radio signals off of the Earth's upper atmosphere and down to a location well beyond the horizon since the 1920s. It was first done almost 20 years earlier than that by Guglielmo Marconi, inventor of the first wireless radio equipment. However, he didn't quite realize what he'd done. He falsely concluded that the radio waves must follow the curvature of the Earth, and skepticism about this claim led him and others to do further research. It was eventually discovered that the ionosphere, the electrically charged layer of the upper atmosphere beginning at around 48 kilometers in altitude, was actually bouncing these radio waves down to Earth. High frequency signals when entering the ionosphere are bent back towards the Earth by neutral air that has been ionized by photons, solar particles, and cosmic rays. 
Skywave quickly became a common method for shortwave radio over long distances, emergency services, more localized radio station audiences, and of course, for the military. And herein lies the problem. Skywave isn't exactly entirely reliable. The ionosphere isn't a fixed source for signal bouncing. It varies, undulating like the surface of an ocean in strength and intensity. This causes a phenomenon called fading, which does exactly what it says on the tin. The signal will begin to diminish and lose strength, making communications inaudible or indecipherable. The situation gets worse during periods of high solar activity, which can make Skywave an all but unusable method in some cases. So, say the Soviets cut the undersea cables. The primary method of communication is now gone. All we have left are unreliably bouncing radio signals off of the sky, and that's not going to work all the time. So what is the solution here? Well, one harebrained idea was cooked up by MIT Lincoln Laboratory, and it went far enough that they actually tried it. Project West Ford. Started in 1958 under the name Project Needles, the idea was the brainchild of Walter E. Morrow, director of the Lincoln Laboratory at the time. What if, he proposed, Earth had a permanent radio reflector in low orbit? Imagine a needle made of a conductive material like copper, about 1.8 centimeters in length. This is half the wavelength of the 8 gigahertz transmission signal coming from Earth, and when it hits the needle, the needle would effectively act as a dipole antenna, reflecting the signals without the need for an unreliable ionosphere. Of course, this antenna is only roughly the size of a human hair, so to effectively create this low orbit radio reflector, you'd need a lot of them. More specifically, you'd need about 480 million of them. These days, it's pretty obvious to see why this is a terrible idea, but we'll come back to that. These were the days of NASA and the military being far more intrinsically linked than they are today. The men in charge were less concerned with the engineering details of what they were doing, and more concerned with whether or not it would work. NASA at this time bought into the Big Sky Theory, which, in aviation, posits that the sheer scale of the sky makes mid-air collisions extremely unlikely, especially when combined with safety and navigation standards. While this tends to work in the atmosphere fairly well, being in orbit adds an extra layer. Again, we'll come back to it. The bottom line is, those in charge saw no problem with the West Ford proposal, and so it was put into motion. While the project was being developed, people started to get a little nervous and begin to speak on the possible problems that might arise. Since there was very little in orbit at this time, the problem of space junk wasn't widely considered. Instead, the main concern was astronomy. With a blanket of copper needles in the sky, Celestial navigation and observation would become extremely difficult. Observation of near-Earth objects as well as ground-based study of the planets would be significantly hindered. The counter-argument tended to be quite simple. This was a matter of national security. However, this wouldn't be enough for very long. The Space Science Board of the National Academy of Sciences began to hold confidential discussions to perform some risk-benefit analysis of West Ford to calm the worries of astronomers. President Kennedy attempted a compromise, proposing that the West Ford needles would be dispersed into a low orbit, making them likely to re-enter the atmosphere within two years, making the project more of a proof of concept than anything else. No further launches would be conducted until the results of the first were properly studied and analyzed. However, no one could fully guarantee exactly what would happen to half a billion orbiting copper needles. Project West Ford saw three launches in total, though only one would be successful. All three flew aboard an Atlas Agena rocket, specifically the Atlas LV Agena B. They were also flown as secondary payloads alongside Midas satellites, standing for Missile Defense Alert System. These were early warning satellites that seemed very appropriate to be launched alongside West Ford, since they're another product of Cold War paranoia. The first launch was on October 21, 1961, alongside Midas 4. While the main payload was successful, the needles were not, failing to disperse from the dispenser. The second launch on the 9th of April 1962 was also unsuccessful, however there isn't much detail on why, military secrecy and all. Additionally, there isn't a whole lot of detail on precisely how the needles were dispersed. We know the mechanism for doing so was this spring-loaded contraption, but I've struggled to find exact details on how it worked. It is known that the needles were released in clumps embedded in a naphthalene gel that was designed to quickly evaporate once exposed to the vacuum of space. However, this didn't go precisely as planned, when the third launch successfully dispersed about 480 million copper needles into a roughly 3,000 kilometer polar orbit. A lot of this gel didn't evaporate, ever, and left the needles floating in large clumps. 
The Soviet Union had a field day with this deployment. The headline of the state-run Pravda newspaper at the time was USA Dirty Space, but the first tests of using the copper ring to relay voice communications were successful. Project Westford was quickly declared to be a technical success, but as the dipole needles continued to disperse and get further away from one another, the transmission rate began to fall off considerably. Despite my earlier mention of a Saturn analog, this artificial ring couldn't actually be seen by the naked eye unless you were exceptionally close to it. Big sky indeed. However, the military considered it a successful proof of concept. The idea was sound. At the time, the US Army was gaining something of a reputation, especially regarding space experiments. Project Starfish Prime, which detonated a nuclear weapon above Earth's atmosphere, had created strange auroras in tropical regions and a dangerous electromagnetic pulse to cities in Hawaii. The army was seen as reckless, carrying out experiments thinking only of potential benefits, drawbacks be damned. West Ford only worsened this reputation, since the army had stated that the many light, thin needles would be pushed down into the atmosphere by solar winds within a matter of years, but they didn't. Most did, but those that were left clumped together remained up there for a lot longer. How long? They're still there. According to a website that tracks orbital debris and active satellites, over 50 West Ford needle clumps are still in orbit as of writing these words, and their altitude hasn't even degraded all that much. So, why exactly is this a problem? Big sky, right? Lots of space to go around? Well, sort of. Sit down, everyone. Let me tell you about Kessler Syndrome. First proposed in 1978, the theory of Kessler Syndrome goes as follows. Say you have two defunct satellites in orbit, and they collide. They're traveling at very high speeds relative to one another, and they're in a vacuum, meaning their collision basically causes both to explode. Now each satellite has become hundreds of tiny pieces of satellites, maybe even thousands. Say two more of those pieces collide. This problem compounds on itself until you have a sky completely filled with debris, a cascading effect that causes more collisions at a faster rate than atmospheric drag can remove them from the equation. Eventually, your big sky is so filled with debris that virtually nothing can launch through it. Getting a payload to low Earth orbit becomes near impossible, and the collisions will create eccentricities in existing debris orbits that can extend upwards thousands of kilometers. Congratulations, we have effectively trapped ourselves on Earth. The introduction of Kessler Syndrome as a theory has resulted in significantly boosted research into the problem of space debris, with the vast majority of it being actively tracked and categorized nowadays, hence the fact that I was able to pull up and real-time track the remaining West Ford needles. A 1979 study by Kessler himself used optical telescopes to begin cataloging space debris, discovering that the published NORAD number of junk objects was approximately 50% lower than reality. 42% of junk objects were found to be the result of explosions of upper stage engines, primarily those in the Delta rocket family. Adding to the issue are ASAT tests, or anti-satellite weapons. These are frequently nothing more than well-timed missiles fired up from the ground to impact and destroy existing satellites, primarily as a show of force to demonstrate strategic use of ASAT capabilities. The obvious problem is, when you fire a missile at a satellite, it explodes into many more pieces of debris, just like a collision. Sure, you've decommissioned that satellite, but at what cost? Over the years, we have done a much better job of keeping track of space debris, but have done very little about removing existing debris. As of 2024, more than 25,000 junk objects larger than 10 centimeters in diameter are known to exist. There are around half a million smaller particles. The total weight of space junk is expected to be in the range of 9,000 metric tons. Kessler syndrome remains a concern today, with services such as the SpaceX Starlink mega constellation only increasing those concerns. We are putting more and more into orbit without a whole lot of regard for what we do with it once it's defunct, and Kessler Syndrome may one day be a reality we have to face. Project West Forward is a prime example of the kind of disregard for consequences that have led to the current state of affairs. Though I will add that personally, I am less concerned about things like Starlink causing Kessler Syndrome over, say, defunct upper stages. Two things effectively killed Project West Forward before it could see another launch. In 1962, NASA launched Telstar-1, the first true communications satellite. This now-defunct but still-orbiting probe was operated by AT&T and allowed the first live television broadcast across continents. Telstar-1 only operated for about seven months. Ironically, it was taken out by one of those previously mentioned high-altitude nuclear tests by the Army. However, it had proven that the concept worked. 
It wasn't a new concept. Arthur C. Clarke had theorized geostationary communication satellites in the 1940s, but Telstar had demonstrated the practicality, much as West Ford had confirmed its own idea works. However, one is clearly better than the other. A handful of communication satellites in strategically placed positions over specific parts of the Earth, or millions of copper needles that need to be replaced every few years and remain in orbit as a hazard for future missions. Which way, Western man? The second thing to finally put the nail in West Ford, or rather put the needle in West Ford, was the protesting. Finally, people began to listen to the scientists and engineers who were begging for people to realize what a terrible idea this was. There came a global demand for the United States to be held responsible for its creation of space debris, though there was less concern for the Soviet Union who, let's be honest, wasn't doing a whole lot better in this regard. And the demand actually resulted in provisions that were placed in the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, in addition to prohibiting nuclear weapons use in space, maintaining that the moon and other celestial bodies remain non-militarized, and ensuring the safe return of fallen astronauts, the Outer Space Treaty now ensured that each nation would be held personally responsible for what they do in space, and this included the creation of debris. West Ford died in the early 60s with the advent of communication satellites, but ideas never die. Space Twitter recently collectively realized the massive gains spaceflight has made over the years in terms of payload capacity to orbit. With upcoming super heavy lift vehicles such as SpaceX's Starship, we no longer have to settle for a measly 480 million needles. Now we have the possibility for 23 septillion copper needles. Kessler syndrome be damned. And this is the point where I will shill the Perigee Aero Store, where you can get a variety of spaceflight related merchandise from my good friend Perigee from infographics talking up your favorite rockets, to funny memes, to stuff that is just plain awesome, and much of it is drawn by Space Based Fox, the same person who made the thumbnail for this very video, and has done merch for my store. Go ahead and check the link in the description, and get yourself some Perigee merch. Disclaimer, we are fully aware West Ford 2 is a terrible idea and should not be done, it's just for the funnies, please relax.